How to do a pattern search. First of all, you would have to think of the goal of the pattern search. In this video, I will focus on the two main reasons why you would want to do a pattern search. A prior art search and a freedom to operate search. In your prior art search, your goal would be to find out whether a certain invention is new and inventive over the prior art so that you could attack a corresponding patent based on lack of novelty or lack of inventive step or obviousness. In this type of search, you can keep the search quite narrow. You can focus on the key concept of the invention and include the exact keywords and the synonyms of these keywords from the patent claim or from the description that are relevant to this particular invention. Let's use an example. In this example, I use a database called Total Patents from LexisNexis, but I'm sure you can find other very good databases that fulfill the exact same purpose. It just happens that we subscribe to this particular database. Um, so let's jump into this particular example. Let's say in our example that you have a client uh, who comes to you and says he has invented a new hairdryer and the hairdryer is special because the hairdryer has concentric blades. Um, then you can do a prior art search and see whether such a hairdryer has existed before that date. Um, so what you would do is um, you can search for exactly these terms in a first trial. Uh, that's what I do. Um, because if you already find a deadly prior art document, then you can already, then you're already done and you can finish your search. So what you would do is, uh, for example, hair dry and say, or hair dry, uh, hair dry uh, and truncated. And I use total patent and the truncation there would be an exclamation mark. Um, and then you would combine this with uh, concentric blades uh, and cons concentric blade and truncation. Um, and then you would, uh, since this is a prior art search, you want to search as many documents as possible. So I selected all the different um, nationalities that are available in this database. Um, I can say also search for English machine translations and uh, then I can say search. So um, this search was quite successful. Um, I found documents uh, with hair dryers with concentric blades. Um, so only four documents. But this is enough. Uh, so the general idea of hair dryers with concentric blades is already known. If you happen to have more than these results, let's say 200 or 300 results, and you want to limit the search to only the hair drying devices, then you can edit the search and you can limit this by the classification. So you can say and classification and then you would enter the classification for hair drying devices, which happens to be A45D20, and I truncate this. And then you can search, and then probably you have the same four results, or only three results, see? Um, one results, uh, one last result went uh, out of the result list because it was not a hair drying device that was claimed. So that's how you can limit your search. If you don't find any good um, um, documents and no deadly documents, for example, if you want to attack a patent, um, then you can uh, find try to find uh, synonyms for all these terms. Let's say hair dryer, you can find synonyms for this or blades or concentric and try to amend the search so you can find more documents. This kind of search is usually performed before filing a patent application or if you want to attack a patent with an opposition or with cancellation proceedings. 
Let's look at the other type of search that I wanted to explain, the freedom to operate search or freedom to operate analysis or short FTO. Let's say you are a manufacturer of hair shampoo and you want to find out whether you are infringing any third-party patents with your new product. In this type of search you do not want to limit your search to certain keywords. You want to keep your search quite narrow. So first of all maybe you can limit the search by your competitors um, if that's possible. I mean if you know that you are typically attacked by a handful of competitors, let's say the five big players in the hair care um, field, uh, then you can limit your search to these patents, um, to these competitors. On the other hand, you might be able to limit the search to uh, a certain territory. So if you launch your product only in Europe, um, you don't need the patents in Peru or in Chile or anywhere in Asia. So you can limit the search to European patents, to PCT applications and to the national patents and patent applications in Europe. And then of course uh, you can limit the search to any patent rights uh, from the last 20 years or 21 years to be exact because the du maximum duration of a patent is typically 20 years except maybe in the pharmaceutical field. And why do you use 21 years? Yes, because um, there can be a priority year. So there can be a first application, let's say in Germany, and then there's a following application in Europe, and that can be filed one year after the German patent application, but it can last 20 years. So the total duration of patent protection, uh, let's say from the first filing would be 21 years. And then of course you should limit the search to a certain technical field um, and the technical field is defined by IPC classes, so-called IPC classes. So all technical fields have a certain IPC class. Um, I can explain that system in a later video. And it's helpful to limit the search by IPC classes, otherwise you have uh, tons of uh, results that are completely not relevant to your concept. Now you might ask why you don't limit the search by keywords. Well if you limit the search by keywords, for example by let's say a certain ingredient um, and you know the name of the ingredient in English, then you uh, might have the risk that um, the name of this particular ingredient is different in Bulgarian language or in Greek language or in French language or that there are synonyms or uh, certain identifiers of this um, uh, component that you don't know and then you would miss um, all these uh, patent rights in your search and um, there would be probably a patent that is uh, valid and and then you would have the situation where there might be um, a valid patent uh, for example in France um, that you didn't find because um, you limited the search to a certain keyword in English or German and that uh, can often be a problem. So then you have a long list of um, patents that you found or patent applications and what do you do first? Uh, the first thing you do is find out whether these patents or patent applications are in force um, the databases give you a first hint um, and some databases claim that they already have the legal status uh, included but uh, never trust these databases. Uh, that's just my personal experience. Um, I always go to the local registries. Um, for example, if I have a German patent, I found a German patent, I go to the German patent registry and find out whether this patent is in force. And if the patent is not in force, of course, you can just uh, immediately skip uh, to the next result in the list. And then you would have to look at the claims, whether your product falls under the certain claims, the independent claims that are um, granted in that certain patent. If I find out that the product would fall under the independent claims, then I can do a prior art search, so the first type of search, to find out whether I can successfully attack that patent uh, based on lack of novelty or lack of inventive step um, and therefore find out whether the patent is enforceable or not. 
you see that the um, freedom to operate search or FTO in short can be very broad and very time consuming and therefore very costly. So you can see that it can be very helpful to limit the search with uh, certain limitations um, and uh, be aware that all these limitations can increase the risk that there is a patent uh, outside there that you didn't find in your search. In this video I could barely scratch the surface of what patent search is all about but if you like this video please subscribe to my channel um, give me your comments and questions below this video and share this video with your friends and colleagues. I know that enlisting the help of a patent attorney can be very costly, but uh, in my experience it is worth every penny. And as always, reap your ideas.